Hello students, welcome to lecture 29 of the online course on nanophotonics, plasmonics and metamaterials. Today's lecture will be on guided mode resonance. So, here is the lecture outline. We will give a quick introduction to guided mode resonance. Uh, we will go through the definition, the basic concepts and theory, some of the polarization properties of the guided mode resonance and then we will see the filter design based on guided mode resonance, the filter spectral response and resonance regime of GMR and then we will provide a summary of this particular topic. So, the first question comes to mind is what is guided mode resonance? So, we have seen resonance phenomena in photonics which actually allow for strong localization of electromagnetic waves and that has got numerous applications something like narrowband filtering, chemical and biological sensing, lasing, harmonic generation, um, Raman scattering, photovoltaics etcetera. Now, the important parameters that describe a resonance feature are its intensity and the spectral line width that will actually decide the Q factor, the quality factor of the resonance. In most practical applications, resonances with strong intensity and narrow line width are desirable. As you can understand high Q resonances are always desirable in most practical applications. There are applications where you actually look for broadband absorption or broadband resonance. Those cases will come in the subsequent lectures. Today we are looking for very very narrow line width uh, filters. Okay. So, high resonance intensity, what are the benefits that can give you better signal to noise ratio and when you have uh, narrow line width that actually gives you very very strong field confinement. So, you are actually focusing uh, your beam at a very very uh, narrow spot. So, this is what is the um, thing you can uh, relate to narrow line width. So, it can give you you know larger field confinement. However, most of the resonances are constrained by a kind of trade off between these two important parameters resonance intensity and line width and this uh, limits the possibility of uh, independent tailoring of the resonant features at will. So, you are not able to kind of tune intensity and line width uh, independently based on your requirement. So, that, that luxury is not there. Now, when you think of uh, guided mode resonance, this is where the guided mode resonance becomes very important. So, it can provide a tailorable uh, resonance intensity with narrow line width through geometrical design and selection of material. So, this kind of uh, filters, the filters designed based on guided mode resonance can give you very high quality factor. So, due to this versatile nature of GMRs, they are found in a wide range of applications. One, one application we can see here is that high Q filter. So, this is how typically a um, GMR will look like. So, it is a guided mode resonance, there is a grating and then there is a waveguide below this. So, as you can see there is light incident, some part is getting reflected and the remaining is getting transmitted. So, the refractive index here, it, this is air, so you can take refractive index to be 1, this is silica, so it is 1.4, we are considering the periodicity, the lattice period to be 6.91, that is the grating period. Okay. You can think of high low, high low and these are made of germanium and selenium, so that is n equal 4 and 2.64 and when you actually um, look into the grating thickness, this is particular thickness of the grating that is 3.8 micrometer and the fill factor of the high material is 0.42. So, 42 percent of the grating period is basically germanium, the remaining is uh, SE. Okay. So, with that when you see the diffraction efficiency, we will see that uh, over the wavelength, if this is the wavelength thing, so this actually gives the spectrum. So, the blue one tells you the transmission peak, it is a very narrow peak as you can see okay, and it is giving also a reflection dip. So, that particular wavelength, um, only one particular wavelength is able to escape and remaining all are reflected. You can also look into um, the electric field profile at the peak wavelength of T0 and that corresponds to the T 
polarization state. And what is this uh, dashed line? That is basically the effective uh, homogeneous layer. So, here you see you do not actually see any kind of resonance. So, the resonance comes from the grating and the grating does something uh, which because of which um, you are able to only allow one particular wavelength to pass through it remaining all are getting reflected. So, there is something very very interesting about this particular phenomena. So, as you see that GMR devices primarily consist of a diffractive grating and then you have a in plane waveguide. The grating will diffract the in fact, uh, incident light and some, some diffracted wave will basically couple to the waveguide and it propagates as the guided mode. And this guided mode is designed to be leaky and it leaks out when it interferes interferes with the free space propagating electromagnetic wave and that gives it that uh, resonance GMR. Okay? So, through the selection of material, grating design, dielectric layer thickness, angle of incidence, the GMR can provide a wide range of spectral features. So, you can actually tune the transmission or resonance uh, peak or deep as you can see here depending on all these parameters which are very easily tunable. So, that makes this GMR filters very very interesting. So, there are other names of this particular um, device it is also called resonant waveguide gratings RWG or we have already seen this name GMR grating or you can also call them uh, waveguide mode resonant gratings. Okay. So, these RWGs as you can see they are basically dielectric structures where the resonant uh, diffractive element they actually benefit from the leaky guided modes okay. and they can be tuned from UV to microwave and other frequencies also okay, for different different configuration. Mainly they are used in this particular uh, range and they are they can also be tuned to optical and infrared. Okay. So, a resonant waveguide grating can be defined uh, can be defined as a thin waveguiding film in optical uh, contact okay or it is merged with a uh, grating as you can see here okay so this particular one actually shows the grating and then there is this waveguide below it okay so this particular figure shows a four port configuration so, 1, 2, 3, 4 there are 4 ports and the white arrows are basically the inputs okay, and um, the blue ones are basically the outputs. Okay. Light is considered to be incident from the free space which is coupled into a waveguide mode and then that can outcouple resonantly in a specular reflection or transmission and that is how it works. And here the substrate and superstrate they are not shown but uh, they actually act as a Cladding. So, when you think of this waveguiding film, okay, it operates usually by having a higher refractive index than the surrounding media because that is how waveguiding will take place. Waveguiding typically happens based on your uh, total internal reflection for which the core this, this will be the core in that case waveguide core has to have a higher refractive index than the cladding. The thin film supports a discrete number of guided modes because of its thin dimension. So, the finite number of modes are allowed and the waveguide modes can be limited to the fundamental mode that is the zeroth order mode in case this is very very thin or it can actually go up to few modes if uh, they are bit slightly thicker and for T and T m polarization you can have different mode indices. Now, depending on the wavelength uh, this leads to uh, a very high reflection or transmission giving rise to zeroth order reflection as you can see here. Okay? So, this is how the grating is made on top of a um, you know thin waveguide and you see this is the incident plane wave some part is getting reflected some is some is getting diffracted and when this diffracted mode couples with the leaky mode okay, it actually. So, this is how it travels okay, and it leaks out as well. So, this is how you actually get the transmission. Okay? So, in this particular example it has been designed to have a reflection peak and a transmission deep. So, you can actually um, design the filters or 
the guided mode resonance filters like that. So, those efficient resonances that you have seen here can be as narrow as 0 0.1 nanometer line width and they are very very sensitive to the incident angle and the wavelength and you can see a typical angular to spectral line width ratio is like 0 0.1 degree nanometer inverse. So, you can actually see they are very very sharp so they can give rise to very high Q resonance and they are also tunable. Now, depending on um, the length and the phase delay that is accumulated during the propagation in the wave guide, the destructive interference can occur either in reflection or in transmission. Now, this is why in the previous case we saw a transmission peak, in this case we saw a transmission dip. So, you can actually, so the modes that are coming, the waves that are coming out, if the destructivity interfere, they will cancel that particular transmission at that particular wavelength. If the constructively interfere, they will get a peak. So, you can actually design this particular phase delay and um, that is accumulated along the propagation of the waveguide. So, the length of this device also plays a important role. Now, for a given polarization and wavelength, an RWG can support various guided modes as you can understand, having different mode index and therefore, transverse polarization, different transverse propagation speed and momentum. So, light can be coupled to the waveguide modes by different grating orders. So, diffraction grating if you remember, not only the 0th order, there will be plus 1, plus plus 1, minus 1, plus 2, minus 2, plus 3, minus 3 and so on. So, all the diffraction orders are possible. So, a particular which angle that actually meet that, that that is more than the critical angle at this interface that will be total internally reflected and that will continue to propagate in this waveguide, right. And some part of it will leak out and that, that is how the leaky waves are also coming. So, in this particular case, you can see that some of this guided wave is diffracted out of the waveguide while propagating, coupling back to the radiation and um, interferes with the non-coupled reflected light. So, here uh, the reflected ones are basically, okay, the reflected ones, this should be um, blue, the reflected ones should be, uh, okay, there is, a, there is a mistake here. So, the reflected ones are basically magenta and transmitted ones are blue, ok. So, yeah, this, this should be corrected. So, this is how it, it works, ok. So, here you can actually see this light uh, yellowish kind of wave propagation inside. So, when a con complete destructive interference happens in the transmission that happens at a specific angle and a specific wavelength, you can actually get a narrowband reflection. So, that is how you can actually get this particular uh, feature as you have seen here. So, it is clear that this uh, RWGs or GMRs are very good at uh, filtering ok and uh, for especially for collimated light they are very good filters and they have extremely efficient uh, diffraction elements they can be designed to be ok. And, um, the structures usually consist of all dielectric material, so they are highly transparent and uh, they can be used either in transmission or reflection mode. There is nothing absorbing here, there is no metallic component, so these structures do not uh, suffer from thermal heating and um, they can be used for very high optical power applications such as mirrors or other diffractive elements. So, these are safe to use, they will not heat up. Now, depending on the, you know, um, geometry, there are different types of uh, RWGs, ok. So, the each ridge and groove corrugating the waveguide layer that you see this one, this is how you are corrugating the waveguide layer, ok. You can actually um, design different kind of RWGs. So, this one as you see, this is a single sided rectangular corrugation of the waveguiding layer but this one is a double sided corrugation ok. This one is a waveguiding layer corrugated to its full thickness. So, it is basically you know you have just uh, etched the entire thing ok and uh, this is actually giving you discrete ribbon kind of uh, structure 
and this is the same thing but you are having this ribbons on top of a wave guiding layer this is a single sided sinusoidal corrugation of the wave guiding layer whereas this one is a double sided uh, sinusoidal corrugation so these are different kind of corrugations that you can uh, make okay and um, they actually decide the pattern of your quasi guided or leaky modes and also tell what kind of mode can propagate okay so rwgs can therefore be considered as temporal or spatial optical integrators as well as they can be used to enhance the local electromagnetic field as example for uh, sensing or nonlinear optics applications now let us uh, have a look at the basic concepts of uh, gmr okay so this is a grating structure and this is the waveguide that you have seen now in most um, elementary structure in this case is a planar unslanted grating okay in a asymmetric waveguide geometry why we are calling asymmetric because epsilon 1 and epsilon 3 are not same here that we take them as different and the relative permittivity or the dielectric constant of this region 2 can be specially modulated like this so this is x direction this is z so epsilon x can be varied like this epsilon g is basically the average um, relative permittivity and uh, delta epsilon is the uh, modulation amplitude and it is having a uh, cosine variation where k is basically 2 pi by lambda while lambda capital lambda is the grating period now we understand that the waveguide grating okay this is the waveguide grating so it should have a permittivity which is larger than both epsilon 1 and epsilon 3 okay so this is where the waveguide grating is okay so this is also called as a guided mode resonance filter or gmrf now for t polarization you can consider the electric field vectors to be normal to the plane of incidence in this figure okay the couple mode equations which govern the wave propagation in this uh, waveguide grating can be written in this form i'll not go into the details of this but i'll just highlight a few important factors that is this s cap is basically the amplitude of the inhomogeneous plane wave um, of the ith space harmonic so you have got this i index k is basically the um, free space wavelength and theta is the internal angle of reflection and that is this one okay so you start with the coupled mode equations and when you put um, delta phi equals 0 in this equation okay you actually make this uh, to be an unmodulated dielectric waveguide it simply becomes a normal uh, waveguide so in that case the equation also uh, simplifies and it looks like a normal wave equation of this form where beta is the propagation constant now a guided wave can be excited if the average or if, if the effective uh, waveguide index of refraction n that is given by beta by k is in this range so it has to be the modulus of n should be um, lower than you know um, square root of epsilon g but it has to be greater than or equal to the maximum of the refractive index of this or this whichever is maximum so this is how you can ensure that the mode will be propagating guided okay so this is very uh, this is a very common uh, kind of uh, requirement that comes from the waveguides that uh, you can study in any other course okay but one important thing is that when you put this delta epsilon to be zero in that equation and when you compare uh, that with the equation two that we have seen here okay you can find out that beta can be written as this okay so that is basically the effective propagation constant in the waveguide grating and this also corresponds to a effective uh, refractive index but there it corresponds to the ith mode okay so n i can be written as beta i over k now the propagation constant beta i of the wave guiding in the limit that you know delta epsilon is zero or tending to zero okay is thus given in the terms of the basic parameters something like basic wave guiding para grating parameter that is capital lambda epsilon g theta lambda i and all these things so this is how you can actually see these two equations 
and you can put the same arguments here also for the tm case and you will see that you know these equations are valid these conditions are valid for both uh, t and tm polarization okay so here let us refer to the eigen mode equations of this unmodulated slab wave guide okay so this will become slab wave guide when delta epsilon tends to zero as you can understand the corresponding eigen value um, equation of the modulated wave guide can be written as you know this so you can actually find out that 10 delta uh, 10 kappa id will be given by this one so kappa i is related to the propagation constant in the different regions okay so this these are again all coming from the waveguide theory so we'll just have a quick look we'll not go into very much details of this just i'm just showing you the formula here that will give you some idea that how this uh, the gmr effect has come so for tm polarization the eigenvalue equation looks like this so the previous one was for t this one is for tm so in the limit of uh, delta epsilon tending to zero okay so the equation that you've seen for t or tm and uh, the range that is the equation three this one they are all holding good so they all govern the mode coupling so it all, all tell you that which all modes are possible okay this is that e equation 3 and uh, this also governs the resonant behavior of this uh, waveguide grating filter with the modified propagation constant beta i okay so here in this case um, this will contain the grating parameters explicitly what is d you remember d is basically the thickness of this waveguide grating so these are the conditions that you have seen okay and uh, for any parameter varied in fact the resonance free um, parametric range in the limit of epsilon tending to zero can be found from these two equations so these are the eigenmode equations that tell you the modes which are allowed to propagate in this particular grating and this you can find because all these coefficients gamma i delta i and kappa i they depend on epsilon g theta lambda this is the wavelength of light this is the grating period and this is the index okay so the resonance free region um, especially represents the separation between the two modes makes sense so every resonant mode is there and there is also a region between those where you know different modes can propagate in a equivalent uh, unmodulated slab waveguide that corresponds to the uh, waveguide grating. So whenever there is a grating there are some specific modes. So in between there will be some resonance free region. So we will also look into those how to identify those particular region. Now if the ith diffracted wave corresponds to the guided mode then the resonance free uh, range in the thickness in thickness for both t and tm polarization can be given as delta d which is pi over kappa i and you can write this as expand this in this particular form so let us take one example so if you are looking at the t eigenvalue ex equation so the t eigenvalue equation was written as this okay and solve when you solve for lambda that gives a free spectral range that can be written as delta lambda fsr nu and that is basically the resonance at nu plus 1 minus the resonance wavelength at nu so nu is basically your 0 1 2 and so on these are the integers which are used for leveling the uh, waveguide modes now since the eigenvalue expressions uh, for t and tm modes are different and the resonance occur at different parametric locations okay so that that is that is uh, easily understood that the eigenvalue equations for t and tm modes are different so the uh, resonance for t and tm mode will occur at different uh, parametric location okay so these are the two equations for your quick reference now you can consider these as uh, parameters okay and that that will uh, allow you to calculate these are like 
some parameters that you can take and you can calculate what will be the positions of the T and T m resonance modes. Now, to quantify the T T m polarization separation of the filters, you can apply um, these equations to produce this particular graph. So, this is how you are plotting the T 0 and this T m 0, okay? this is T 1, T m 1 and this is T 2 and T m 2. So, what are these? These are basically showing you the T T m polarization, polarization separation and the normalized this all these are normalized to the so this is basically the grating thickness normalized by its period this is the lambda normalized to the grating period so these are normalized one this also tells you about the separation between the um, modes okay and it also tells you the resonance free regions so these are the regions which are free of resonances so for a given uh, normalized filter thickness okay d lambda the normalized wavelength separation between T and T m mode you can find from here. Okay? So, these are basically, so for a particular value you can find out what is the um, lambda separation for 0th order T m mode and 0th order T mode. You can use this graph and find it out. So, if you assume that uh, D equals uh, say 1000 nanometer okay, and you can see that the fundamental um, that mode that is nu equals 0 and if, if you consider the separation between the T0 and Tm0 you will find that the resonances are separated by um, 24 nanometer. So, that you can find from this particular graph. Okay? Other, other kind of separations like what is the separation between T0 and uh, um, like this particular when you take this value you can actually have T one mode as well as T zero mode, you can actually find out what is the lambda corresponding to um, these two resonances. So this particular uh, figure is very important because it gives you all these uh, resonance positions and also it tells you about the resonance free regions. Okay. Now, as we have considered normal incidence in this example, so here, what are the parameters? If you see the parameters this will be the parameters considered okay so we are considering normal incidence and other parameters are also given so the inequality actually boils down to this so this is the condition when you put epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 and other parameters you will see this is the condition that will actually uh, give the normalized wavelength range that you see so this particular range 1.47 to 1.73 so, this is the range that you have plotted here. Hmm. So, this has basically come from this one. Okay. So, this actually uh, tells you. Hmm, so, you have actually uh, put i equals plus minus 1 in this equation. Okay. And you have obtained epsilon 1, epsilon 3 are the values that you have shown there. So, once you put that, you will get this particular range. So, this is why this particular range is considered because in this configuration or the material choice, this will be the normalized uh, wavelength that you have to consider. Now, the figure also additionally can be used to find out the resonance free region as I told you. So, you can actually see these regions okay, um, in filter wavelength and thickness in both parameter which region is resonance free you can find out. So, you can actually take uh, d by lambda equals constant like this and obtain those region where resonance is not there or you can consider the thickness and see whichever portion has no resonance. So, the analytical expression you can obtain for resonance free range. So, when you calculate, so you will see the delta d that is the you know in thickness what is that thickness where there is no resonance you can obtain it like this i'm not going to um, the details of these equations there are uh, complicated equations even you can obtain them from this particular paper but this actually tells you how this uh, separations are basically obtained and when you combine this inequality of this equation and this one you will actually get 
this particular equation because you know the relationship between beta by k is basically your n so you can put this guy here and you will get this uh, particular expression so here you can also see that if you want to make epsilon square root of epsilon 1 that is n1 sin theta 1 equals the refractive index of this one that is square root of epsilon g sin theta okay so that way you will be able to you know make a range which are the uh, allowed angles for your particular device so with that you can identify the resonance regime okay so this uh, expression allows you um, to define the parametric regime where the guided mode resonance actually occurs so this is particularly a plot that shows those resonance regime okay so on the x axis you have the normalized wavelength and on the y axis you have uh, angle theta okay so this actually um, gives you the selected values of the average permittivities with the diffraction order i as a parameter so here you see this is for i equals plus one this is i equals minus one this is i equals plus two this is i equals minus two okay and again the parameters that we have considered here is epsilon one is one epsilon g is three and epsilon three is 2.161 so the solid curves that you see here on the left side of the inequality okay um, so here the left side of the inequality is actually coming from this solid line okay and uh, the right side is shown by this dashed line that is coming from this one so the right side inequality gives you this one for a particular i okay and the left side inequality gives you this solid line okay for that particular i and the shaded region between the two lines are basically those parameter values for which resonance can take place so this can be called as uh, resonance regime okay and these are the boundaries for i equals 1 right so the solid boundaries correspond to the diffracted order i at the gazing angle okay at which the classic uh, Rayleigh anomaly is associated so we'll see what what is that uh, Rayleigh anomaly uh, in the next slides so here one important thing is to uh, note that at the intersection of the two solid uh, curves a double Rayleigh anomaly takes place okay something like this now when you say about Rayleigh anomaly this is nothing but a anomalous or abnormal behavior of light that is being reflected from a periodically corrugated surface or diffraction grating um, that was observed in the form of rapid variation of intensity of the diffraction orders as a uh, function of the wavelength so it happens um, like this a sharp intensity variation and related exclusively uh, to the emergence of diffracted beams when the incident beam is at glazing angle and you will also get uh, beams which are parallel to the uh, surface of the grating so Rayleigh was the first to uh, represent this particular uh, effect and he was able to explain this so that is why the anomaly is named after him it was pointed out that the anomaly in reflection occurs at wavelengths for which one of the diffracted order becomes parallel to the main plane of the grating like this okay and then eventually uh, it will vanish at greater wavelengths because after that you cannot actually uh, like the reflected one cannot go inside so that has to vanish okay so this changes the power distribution among the remaining diffraction orders including the uh, specular reflection or the zeroth order reflection right so if one one uh, mode is not allowed or one uh, particular uh, order is vanishing so the uh, power has to be distributed among the remaining so that is how the anomaly disturbs the system now, another cause of the uh, anomalous behavior takes into account the possible existence of leaky modes located at the surface so which are coupled to the incident wave such as in the case of surface plus one polaritons so there also you can see in the case of grating it is mainly for those 
uh, diffracted beam orders which are basically parallel to the grating. Now, in the case of the flat surface, the waveguides of such surface waves are greater than the incident waves so that they do not interact. But when you look for periodic structures, the wave vectors of the grating come into the play. So, because of that, you know, the grating or because of that, the coupling becomes possible. And as a result, at certain frequency, the incident wave will generate the leaky surface waves and in that case, the reflected power will decrease. So, this effect becomes resonant and uh, because of that, you know, the reflection curve will get a narrow dip, very narrow dip and that will also give you a, you know, uh, transmission maximum. So, for the light uh, diffraction at the periodic structure, which has got a grating number of g, okay, g can be written as 2 pi by the lattice period, okay. You can say that Rayleigh anomaly will occur if k x plus n times g will be equal to the incident wave vector. So, if this matches, so n is basically 1, 2, 3, this is happening because of the grating. When there is a match, okay, so a Rayleigh anomaly will take place, the wave will leak in, okay and you will get a reflection dip. So, here k is the wave vector or wave number of the incident light and k x basically is the component of the component that is parallel to the grating plane of the wave vector, right, ok. So, um, the two symmetric uh, double Rayleigh anomalies can be seen here when the incident angle is 0 degree. You can see it for uh, i plus minus 1 there is a degeneracy, the other one is for i plus minus 2. So, these are basically symmetric double Rayleigh anomalies. There is also one uh, asymmetric double Rayleigh anomaly that happens at theta equals 30 degree when i equals plus 2 and i equals minus 1. Okay? Now, during the interval um, designated uh, as this resonance regime, the order i can actually correspond to the guided mode. So, you can say this is the first order, second order and so on and this is the equation that you have already seen. So, this theta is the incident angle and this limit tells you that which all modes including the order of the mode that can be allowed to propagate. Now, if you look into the dashed curve okay, with the increasing wavelength. Now, beyond the dashed curve that is uh, we are looking for this one the dashed curves okay the order i is neither uh, propagating nor it is possible to you know, beyond this it is not able to propagate or it is not even guided so in order to actually strike a resonance with this particular regime the eigenvalue equations need to be satisfied so these are the equations that need to be satisfied to fall within this particular regime, right. So, these are the supported modes which basically can propagate and leak out and give you that resonance. Now, their solutions fall within the res, uh, resonance regime with the location uh, additionally dependent on the thickness of the filter that is the parameter d. So, here you can see at uh, 0 degree the resonance of plus minus 1 is um, indistingu indistinguishable because they are overlapping here and at non-zero theta prime that is at non-zero degeneracy. So, you can put plus minus 1 and you can actually see that they actually uh, do not have the degeneracy anymore. And the solid curve that you see here that is leveled as capital lambda r over capital lambda. This indicates the last propagating uh, higher order diffracted mode that is here in this case it is i equals plus 1. Okay? And it gets cut off at grazing angle okay? uh, as the wavelength is permitted to increase. So, as you keep on increasing it actually does not uh, increase further it will actually get cut off here. So, this R is basically the Rayleigh wavelength. So, you can actually call this as the Rayleigh wavelength okay? and when lambda is greater than lambda R, okay, 
you can say only zeroth order wave can propagate okay so in this regime uh, only the zeroth order mode will be propagating not the higher order modes so the diagram um, such as this figure are also useful in visualizing the resonance properties of diffraction gratings now let us look at the effect of modulation amplitude okay so this particular figure calculates uh, an example of the spectral behavior of the symmetric high uh, symmetric filter or symmetric waveguide symmetric means epsilon 1 is considered to be same as epsilon 3 okay and uh, it has high spatial frequency so lambda is considered to be greater than the grating period okay and what are the parameters so epsilon 1 epsilon 3 to be taken as 2.5 epsilon g is 3 this normal incidence these are the parameters we have considered the center free space wavelength to be 1.669 and the line width we got is 0 0.01 nanometer and this d10 these are basically the diffraction efficiencies okay so 10 is reflected 30 is the transmitted one so you can only see that the zero uh, zero forward uh, and backward diffracted waves propagate and in this case all other modes are basically cut off right and the diffraction efficiency represents the intensity of the various diffracted wave so here you can see um, that this is three zero the transmitted one is getting a dip and the reflection one one zero is getting a peak okay and there is a hundred percent energy exchange between these two uh, modes and the smooth lines can be obtained and what is the good thing about this kind of symmetric filter the symmetric waveguide grating filter they also produce very symmetric spectral response so you have zero nulls on both side of the peak and that is a perfectly symmetrical filter which is usually not the case with any other resonant kind of structure and if you see the transmission you get a very no beautiful notch filter okay and if you are allowing the higher order waves to propagate you will see that pure nulls may not be obtained so one of these uh, legs will be kind of uh, asymmetrical and it will be different so if you look into asymmetrical filter where uh, you have epsilon 1 not equal to epsilon 3 and these are the parameters so in that case surely your spectral response is not symmetrical and you do not have null on both sides perfect null on both sides let us also look into the effect of amplitude, amplitude modulation okay so uh, here it shows the uh, normalized um, filter line width as a function of the modulation amplitude of the waveguide grating so these are all um, uh, kind of uh, normalized so delta epsilon is the modulation index and delta uh, lambda is basically the line width and if you take these are the parameters so this is an asymmetric uh, param parameter and you can see that if you consider grating period to be 1 micrometer the line width that you calculate falls in the range of 20 femtometer to you know 200 picometer so that is basically the range so you can understand how narrow this uh, resonance filters are and they are very very high quality resonance and this is a graph that will tell you that uh, for what kind of modulation you should have what kind of line width you can also think about the mode confinement from this particular graph it allows you to see the spectral line width can also be controlled by the degree of confinement of the mode in an associated unmodulated waveguide so if you don't have modulation and you can think of you know an effective unmodulated waveguide so this particular figure shows the numerically calculated um, plot of normalized line width so here you are taking a symmetric case okay but you are considering the difference uh, in the refractive index to be your x-axis and you are varying the line width so here you will see that um, you are varying the parameters from 1 to 2.95 right this is the epsilon 1 that you are varying and this is how you actually get this variation 
Okay. So, strongly confined states something like delta n will be tending to 0 exhibit the largest line width. You can also use this for electro uh, optic switching in some applications something like you know this particular filter illustrates uh, the resonance line under the variation of the average grating permittivity of an uh, asymmetric filter or asymmetric waveguide grating structure. So, here you can see there are many other modes which are getting uh, diffracted. So, here in this particular exam example the break grating is satisfied, but this is not a condition requirement for the uh, resonance to occur. So, the break grating condition lambda over capital lambda equals 2 sin theta is satisfied here and these are the parameters that we considered and you see that 1 0 1 1 3 0 3 1 these modes are also present okay? and that is why you, you are not seeing perfect null in this resonance. The point is that uh, here the resonance uh, can also occur under break condition and with non-zero diffracted wave also propagating as you can see here in this inset pure nulls are not um, obtained next to the resonance and a variation in the relative average relative permittivity can then introduce a resonance. So, in that case a electro optic effect can be used to switch uh, energy from the transmitted to the reflected because you can switch change slightly the um, effective uh, relative permittivity of this grating and that can introduce the resonance or it can uh, move out the resonance. So, you can actually use the electro optic effect for getting this resonance or not. Okay. This particular figure shows the calculated um, T filter reflectivity as a function of wavelength uh, with different incident angles. So, you have got theta equals 0 plus 10 minus 10 plus 20 minus 20 plus 30 minus 30 and so on. So, the peak efficiencies they are all dependent on the uh, incident angle as well. So, here are the parameters which are used for calculating this and for this particular uh, case you have also obtained what are the resonance regime as we have seen. So, here you can actually see that we have calculated for i equals plus 1 and minus 1 okay. and there is a large peak corresponds to i equals minus 1 with smaller peaks happening at i equals plus 2 okay, because there is a case here corresponding to 30. Okay. So, here you can see that uh, at uh, yeah, this is the case for theta prime equals 30 degree which corresponds to um, your plus 2. Okay. The large peak at um, theta prime equals 30 degree corresponds to i equals minus 1. So, this one with a smaller peak caused by the wave with i equals plus 2. So, i equals plus 2 gives this particular smaller uh, width. Okay. So, this is basically seen from this one. So, the same results can also be demonstrated for that other uh, polarization case T m polarization case. So, in this case you can see the resonances are even more narrower okay. and with that we will conclude what we understood in the GMR. So, RWG or GMR basically they use the periodicity of a grating to couple light into a thin waveguide. Uh, they have been therefore used very extensively as uh, waveguide couplers for optical communication and signal processing for both in-coupling and out-coupling of thin waveguide modes with uh, strong wavelength polarization and angular dependence. Their in-coupled uh, quasi-guided mode can interfere dramatically with the incident illumination depending on the phase delay that is accumulated in the in coupling of the waveguide which can create anomalous reflection or transmission features creating unique zeroth order properties. So, you can actually get those very sharp uh, reflection or transmission peak or dip. This mechanism makes them highly efficient narrowband or broadband reflectors as well as transmission filters with applications as laser mirror, advanced detection systems, spectrometers etcetera. So, in other direction 
you can think of cost efficient fabrication processes and unique appearance have enabled their applications in optical authentication and document security. Their polarization dependent behavior can help them to be used as polarizer, polarization uh, rotator, wave plates, etc. The control of the optical near field um, has found widespread application in biological refractive index sensing, fluorescent sensing, nonlinear effects, optical switching, etc., as well as enhancement of the solar light harvesting. So, in the next lecture, we will discuss uh, some of these devices based on this effect. So, with that, we conclude. Thank you for your attention. In the next lecture, we will con consider uh, and discuss the applications of matter surfaces and this GMR based devices. If you have got any queries, you can drop an email to this uh, email address mentioning MOOC in the subject line. Thank you. Mm -hmm.